Stanford University. Welcome to lecture number 10 of Stanford CS193P. It's the spring of 2016. Today we have one topic only, which is core data, okay, which is an object-oriented database. And sometimes when you're building an app, you need to store a huge amount of data, like you're doing some kind of Twitter thing where you're collecting all the tweets and you got all these tweets and you want to search through them and do some kind of queries or something like that. And of course, there's lots of technologies out there uh, for doing that kind of thing, uh, SQL databases and things like that. But really, when we're programming, we want, uh, obviously, all of our stuff to be object-oriented. So iOS has this awesome object-oriented database system called Core Data, okay? Um, it's very powerful. It's actually based on SQL underneath, so it's got all the full kind of power of that. Um, and yet, it interacts with your code, just like all the other object-oriented stuff uh, that you do, especially if you're doing things like table view and stuff like that. It has a lot of good integration uh, with that. So it's essentially a way of creating an object graph that's backed by a database, a SQL database in this case. It can actually be backed by other kinds of databases, XML or just in-memory stuff, but primarily we're using Core Data with SQL as our uh, backing store. And the way it works is you're going to create this visual mapping Okay, uh, and then you're going to create objects in your code. Okay, the visual mapping is going to basically describe your database, and then you're going to create objects in your code uh, that are in that database, and you're going to access the columns in the database, in the rows, if you want, columns in the tables, if you want to think of it that way. But you're going to access the attributes just using vars. So you're going to have objects and vars on them, and those are going to be stored in the database. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through all that. Let's start with creating that visual mapping of the database. Okay, now, just like anything uh, that you do when you're adding a new file to Xcode, whether it's a Swift file or something like that, uh, you're going to start with new file. But in this case, we're not going to be adding a code file. We're actually going to be adding a database mapping file. So you say new file, and then you're going to go down to iOS core data. Okay, if you see where it says core data down there instead of uh, iOS source. Uh, and inside of there, uh, you're going to pick data model. Don't pick mapping model. You want data model. Okay? And it's going to ask you what you want to call this mapping. Okay? This mapping, by the way, we're, what we're mapping between is these objects that we're going to describe in this database and what's going to be in our code. And uh, usually, if you only have one database in your app, you'll call it model because it's usually the model for a lot of your view controllers. Uh, but you could also call it the name of your app, or if you had multiple of them, you could kind of name them appropriately, right? So any name will, is, is fine here. Um, when you create it, it looks like this, okay? It's called model.xcdatamodeld right here. And uh, this is the contents of it, right? We're looking at the contents of it. And uh, it's kind of like a storyboard for the database, okay? You're going to graphically, visually edit your database uh, schema right here. So the database lets you store things, obviously. Uh, the main things that you're storing are called entities, okay? And they're kind of analogous to objects, all right? So here I'm going to create an entity. So I'm going to click on this Add Entity button at the bottom and just say Add Entity. When I do, it creates one up here, and I'm going to change the name of it to Tweet. So for my examples today, let's say we're building a database that's storing some Twitter stuff. We're all in kind of Twitter mode right now with your assignment and stuff, so we'll store some tweets and some Twitter users uh, into this uh, database, okay? Now, this entity tweet that we're going to store in the database, they're going to appear in our code as NSManaged Object instances. So there's a class in iOS called NSManaged Object. Okay, and so all of these entities will appear in our code as NS managed objects. Okay, all right. So uh, in addition to entities, uh, these entities have attributes. So those are kind of like properties on a class, right there. They have relationships. Relationships are kind of like vars that point to other objects in the database. Okay. And then they also have this thing down here called fetch properties, which I'm not going to really talk about, but kind of the name implies what they are. They're essentially properties that are that, that basically represent fetching in the database, so pulling objects out that meet some query or something like that. You can make it look like that's just a property on your entity. We're not, fortunately, we don't have time to talk about that. We're going to focus here on these attributes and relationships. Okay. So to add an attribute, we're just going to hit this little plus sign right here under the attributes, Okay, and it's going to add one. 
Here I'm doing a tweet, right? This my entity is a tweet, so I'm going to put the text of the tweet. Uh, notice as soon as I type, as I added this and type it in, I get start getting an error right here. See, red error up in the uh, upper corner there. Okay, and that's because this tweet or this text attribute on the tweet has no type. Okay, everything that goes in there obviously has to have a type. So you just click on this type to set it, and I'm going to set the text to be a string. Okay, so these are all the types that the attributes, the vars in your tweet entity can be basically. Um, all the ones like integer, decimal, double, float, even Boolean, those are actually stored as an NS number. They appear in your code as an NS number. Okay, uh, this binary data is an NS data. The date is an NS date. And the string here is an NS string. Now remember that you get the automatic bridging, right, from NS string to string. Uh, things like that, uh, even from double and int to NS numbers, right? So uh, even though these are NS numbers and NS string, you're still going to get your Swift-like things when you're using them uh, in your code. Now, you can set any of these things, like this text attribute, using these two methods right here on NS managed object, okay? Value for key, which gets the value, and set value for key. Okay, so value key returns any object, could be an NS number or an NS date or an NS data, right? And set value for key. The key is a string like text. And the value is, again, NS number, NS data, NS date, whatever. Okay, so that's how you can set the data on your object once you get a hold of one of these NS managed objects. Now, I haven't shown you how to get those NS managed objects yet, but I will soon. Um, see, the error is gone because I set, set this to be a string. So here I'm going to add some more attributes, uh, an ID, which is some unique identifier for this tweet. Uh, also created, which is the date the tweet was created. You can see that's an NS date right there. Uh, by the way, this ID, you're probably going to want that in your homework. Uh, just a little hint. I like to give you hints sometimes in the lecture. Uh, so you'll need your unique ID there at some point. Um, we're looking at these attributes on this entity in kind of a table format here, but we can also do it uh, in a graphical way by clicking on this little button down here, this editor style. It changes the style of this editor, and it looks like this. So the graphical one basically has all of my entities and my attributes, but in kind of on a graph paper graphical format. And this is going to make sense when I start having a lot of relationships between entities. Right? Then I'm going to be able to see them here on the graph paper are pointing to each other so I can see what their relationships are. Okay? So let's add another entity in this. We can add entities and attributes in this view just as much as in the table view. So I'm going to go down here and add another entity. This is going to be a Twitter user. Okay? And you can see it added the Twitter user here. It has no attributes or relationships yet. What's really cool is if you move these around and they do have wires pointing to each other, it'll rearrange the wires all over the place to look nice, OK? So that's kind of fun. Um, I can also add attributes from here. So I'm just going down here and say add attribute to add an attribute to my Twitter user. Uh, I'm going to call this attribute screen name. OK, that's like the at sign whatever uh, screen name of the user. Um, notice that if I have this selected, then the inspector over here can be used to inspect things about this attribute. So let's do that. Here's the screen name, its attributes. For example, here's its type. I'm going to set its type to be a string. It has some other attributes here, which I'm not really going to have time to talk about, but you'll definitely, you can look up. You won't need it for any of your homework, obviously, but for your final project, you might. So you can look those up in the documentation for core data. OK, um, I'm going to add another attribute here, which is name. So that's the user's real name. OK, not their at sign, whatever, but their actual uh, real name. Uh, so I'll add that. And now I'm going to add a relationship between these two entities. And of course, we know that a Twitter user is the one who tweets the tweet, right? Um, so there's a relationship between these two. And to create a relationship between these two, I just control drag from one to the other. And I can control drag from either to the other. It really doesn't matter which direction. And when I do that, it's going to create a new thing over here called a relationship on both sides. It called it new relationship by default. We're going to change the name of that, OK, on both sides. And you can see it's got an arrow that points both ways. So now we know there's a relationship on both sides. Now, we want to rename these relationships, just like the attributes have names that are meaningful. We want these to be meaningful names, too. So the tweet, okay, if you look at this relationship to this guy, this is the tweeter, 
Okay, this is the tweeter for this tweet. So I'm going to call the relationship tweeter on this side. Okay, I could probably call it user or something as well, but tweeter is kind of fun. Uh, on the other side, this is tweets. Okay, so this is the tweets that this user has tweeted. Okay, now notice that when you do this, if you inspect either one, like if I inspect tweets right there, it's showing me that the inverse is tweeter, so it knows the inver inverse right there. Okay? Now, there's something different, though, about this tweets relationship to the tweeter relationship, because there are multiple tweets per Twitter user, right? So a user could have tweeted hundreds of times. So this basically is a multiple thing. This is a too many relationship, to use database jargon. Okay? There are many tweets per user, even though there's only one user per tweet. And you define that up here in the inspector. If you have tweets selected, you go here to the type of, connect, of uh, relationship it is, and you can say it's a too many relationship. Okay? And when I do that, notice I get this little double arrow right here. Okay? That's telling me that there are many tweets per Twitter user. Now, this is going to show up differently in my code. This one right here is going to show up in my code. Okay? This tweet thing that I have, this tweet entity, is going to have a var right here called tweeter, it's going to be of type NS managed object. Because I told you all of these entities, this and this, are going to show up in your code as NS managed object. So that's going to be the type of this var. The type of this var over here is going to be NS set. Okay? An NS set, I can't remember whether we talked about that earlier in the quarter, but it's very similar to NS array, okay? but it's unordered and unique. Okay? So an NS array can have the same object in it multiple times, and an NS array is also in order. An NS set, it's just a bunch of objects in there, and if you added the same object again, it would do nothing. Okay? So it's basically a unique set, and there's no order to it. It's just a big jumble of them. Okay? And since this, these tweets are basically a big jumble of tweets done by this user in no particular order, that's why it's an NS set. Now, there is in Swift a, a struct called set, and it is automatically bridged, just like NS array is automatically bridged to array. Okay? So you can think of this as just being a set, but in fact it's an NS set. Okay? And what's in that set? Of course, manage object, NS manage object, because these are in there. Okay? So it's exactly what you would think. All right? Now, there's lots of things you can do okay, in core data. We're going to focus on a small part of it, but the core of it, which is entities, attributes, and relationships, these things that I just told you about. Okay? How do you access all, in this all this stuff in the code? You need an instance of one of these, NS Manage Object Context. You can think of that as kind of the window into the world of your uh, database of objects. Okay? And uh, so you need one of these to be able to do anything in the database. All right? So how do I get one of these? <laughs> OK, I need one of these. Uh, how do I get it? Well, there's really two ways to get it. And you use them kind of about equally. One's not really necessarily preferred over the other. One of them is when you create your project. Do you remember when we create a project, there was a little button at the bottom. There's three switches at the bottom. One was, uh, you, are you going to do testing or UI testing? And the other one on the top of the three buttons was, I'm using core data. Do you remember that button? Anyway, it's there, I promise you. And if you click that button when you create your um, application, then you're going to get a bunch of code provided to you, one of which is a method that gives you one of these shared in your whole application. Okay? And I'm going to talk about that, how that works in a second. Uh, the second way that you can get one of these little guys is to create a UI managed document. Okay? UI managed document has a var on it called managed object context which will give you one of these. Okay? So I'm going to talk about both of these mechanisms for, for getting this. All right, so the first one, where you click the switch. Uh, when you flip that switch, you're going to um, essentially get some code put in that appdelegate.swift file. Remember the appdelegate.swift? It's one of the files we always move into supporting files. One of the first things I ever do is, OK, let's take image assets and appdelegate and info.plist. Let's move them into a little folder called supporting files. Well, we haven't looked at that appdelegate because there's really not much in there uh, at this point. Uh, but the, in there will be a bunch of code for core data Okay, if you flip that switch. Okay, and one of the things in that bunch of code 
is a method called manage object, it's a var actually called manage object context. And all you need to do is call that var and boom, you'll have manage object context to the database for this app. And app delegate is kind of a global resource, but your database is often a global resource, right? All your view controllers want to be able to see the data in the database, so it's reasonable. Now, the way you get at it, uh, you get this DAP delegate. It seems a little complicated, but it's not too bad. You're going to call this uh, class method on UI application called shared application. And this returns you the one and only instance of UI application, which is just a class that represents your app. Okay? Now, that object, UI application .shared application, has a delegate. You all know what delegation is. Okay, it has a delegate. That delegate is that app delegate, the place where that managed object code got thrown, okay? So you're gonna cast it though as app delegate, okay? You could do question mark here and then if it comes back nil, I guess you're SOL, you don't have any <laughs> database. Uh, but here I'm gonna force cast it because if I can't get this managed object context then I can't do anything in my app, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and crash here if for some reason my app delegate is not my delegate of my UI application. So anyway, you do this line of code, and this is going to give you back the managed object context. And now you have the portal that you need to do all the database stuff. Okay, so that's one way to get this portal. The other way is UI managed document. Okay, UI managed document is a class that inherits from UI document, and its only job really is to encapsulate a core data database. That's what it does. It encapsulates a core data database in a file on disk. All right, um, and the way you create a UI managed document, UI managed document is actually really easy, and you might ask, why would I ever do that other clicking the switch and the creating my project and app delegate all that? Why would I do that when I just have this UI managed document? I just create one and get the managed object context. Well, the reason it's a little more complicated here is because it does its work asynchronously. And you guys are only just getting used to asynchrony, so it might seem a little complicated to you. Once you get used to it, it won't seem complicated at all. But when asynchrony is new to you, you know, I manage document, my team a little uh, kind of, oh, how does that work? But here is how it works. Okay, here's a UI managed document. I'm going to create it. First, I'm going to get an NS manager file manager, an NS file manager here. Okay, this is a thing we haven't talked about yet, which lets you access the file system. And of course, I'm going to store my UI managed document in the file system. So I obviously need this little file manager guy right here. Then I also need to know where to put my managed document. And I'm going to put it in the documents directory for my app. So we're going to learn later that your app has a documents directory, it has a caches directory, it has a temporary directory, it has all these kind of named magic directories uh, where you put stuff. And the document directory right here is the one where you probably want to put your user's data. Okay, that's what that directory is really for. So you're going to do this thing, URLs for directory, which returns the document directory, and then you're going to get the first one. This, this returns an array of URLs, like there might be multiple document directories out there. In iOS, there's always only one. If you're on the Mac, some of these directories can return multiple things, because there might be one on the network, there might be one on your local machine, et cetera. But in iOS, there's always only the user, so there's always only one, so we just get the first one out of there. Okay, now I have the documents directory. Now I'm just going to append to the end of that, U it's a URL, so I'm going to append to the end of that URL the name of the document. Okay, so the URL is pointing to the documents directory. If I append uh, the name of the document, now I've got a URL to the document. Now that I have that, I can just create a new UI managed document, right? Just tell it the URL where it is. Boom. So now I have a UI managed document, okay? And I could go get the managed object context from it, except that managed object context is no good unless that file is open, okay? So here's where the asynchrony comes in, okay? We have to open this UI managed document, okay? Usually we check first to see if it's already open, okay? You can ask the document, is your document state normal? That means it's already open and ready to go. So if, that, if it's in that state, then you're good to go. You can just start using that managed object context thing. But it might be in this state closed right here, which means it has not yet been opened. In that case, you cannot use the managed object context yet. Now what if it's closed? How do you open it? Well, you have to use this asynchronous method here, okay? It's called open with completion handler. All right, so first you can find out if the file exists right here by using this file manager thing, file exists at path, 
Okay, see if your document's already there. Uh, if it does exist, then you're going to open it by calling open with completion handler. If it doesn't exist, you're going to create it by using save to URL. These are both methods in UI Managed Document, right? Uh, notice that they take, both of them, a closure. See that? Okay. Why do they take that closure? That's because the open or save happens on another thread. Why is that? Well, because UI Managed Document is really awesome. It works great with iCloud, for example. Okay, And so it might actually make a quick check on the network to see what the status of this document is. Okay? You do not want that blocking your main queue. Okay? So these things, these closures, get called after the document has been opened asynchronously. Now, usually these documents open almost instantaneously, but you're still going to get them open with this callback. And it tells you whether it was successful in doing it. Okay? So the fact that this is asynchronous is going to make your code a little trickier Okay, because you want to open the document and start using manage object context right away, but you can't. You have to wait until this closure gets called. Then you can start using your manage object context. Okay? That's the only trickiness about it. All right? And it's a little tricky that you have to see if it exists or to know whether to open it or to save it. Okay? When you save it for the first time, you're going to do for save operation for creating. Okay? You can actually save your document if you want on top of the existing one by doing uh, for save operation for overriding. Okay? So it's all asynchronous, so be careful about that. Um, there's other states besides closed and normal that you might run into. These are pretty rare states. I'm not going to talk about any of them. Some of them have to do with iCloud, like in conflict. Remember, iCloud lets you see this document on two different devices, your iPad and your iPhone, let's say, and you might change it on one and then try to change it on the other, and now they conflict. The two changes might conflict in the database, right? Um, so they can be in that state. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to handle any of iCloud or anything like that for this class, but you need to know if you're going to do iCloud, then you might have some of these other states cropping up. Okay? iCloud might be a fun thing to do in your final project. One of the things in your final project you have to do is you have to do some feature I didn't go over in lecture. Well, iCloud might be one of those. Okay? So maybe that would be something you want to do. All right, let's talk about saving the document because I got this managed object context and I'm going to be getting these in as managed objects and like tweets and Twitter users and I'm going to be changing them. When does it actually get saved? Okay, and for UI managed document, it auto saves, which is really cool. It basically, auto saves when it thinks it's a good time. So you really don't ever have to save the UI managed object document. You can by doing that for overriding that I was talking about, but you really don't ever have to do that. Okay. It's just going to automatically autosave for you. Um, how about closing the document? It also automatically closes. So as soon as nobody has a strong pointer to it and it wants to leave the heap, it'll close automatically and then leave the heap. Okay, so that's cool too. But if you wanted to forcibly close it and still keep a strong pointer to it, you could do close with completion handler. Again, here's a closure. It takes time for it to close, probably microseconds, but anyway. Uh, this will tell you when it is actually closed. And then its state, document state, will go back to dot closed. Okay? All right. So now we have an NS Managed Object context. We either call that method in our app delegate to get it, or we created a UI Managed Document, opened it, and in the closure, once the closure is executed, bam, now we have this Managed Object uh, context that we can access our databases. Okay? So what do we do with it? How do we... Make it work, okay? Well, let's talk about putting objects in the database, because until we put something in there, can't really do anything else with it. How do we do that? Well, we create objects in the database by using this method right here called insert new object for entity for name. Okay, this is a static method, a class method in the class NS Entity Description. NS Entity Description is kind of a simple little class that just describes the entities. Okay, knows what all the properties are and all that. We really only use it for this one thing, which is to create one of these things in the database, okay? But notice that it takes in managed object context, so you have to have a managed object context or you cannot create a new object, okay? Now, when you create this document or this uh, object in there, all of its properties are either nil or you can actually go in the inspector in the uh, little visual mapper, you can set defaults for some of the properties, okay? So it's either going to be the default you set there, or if you didn't set a default, it'll just be nil, 
Okay, and remember they're all objects, they're NS numbers, NS dates, all these properties, so they'll just be nil. Okay, um, so this creates one. So uh, now you've got a tweet, it's of class, look what its class is, NS managed object, right? Tweet is an NS managed object, I just created one. So I've got an empty tweet, all its properties, its text and everything is nil. Okay, all right, so now I've got one of these, how do I set the values? Okay, well, I already told you how to do that. It's with this set value for key, right? So I can do set value, some string for key text, and I can set the text of the tweet, for example. Okay, same thing, I can get the value for the key. One thing that's kind of cool, there's also this method called value for key path. Okay, there's value for key and value for key path. And value for key path, the string you pass to it can have dots in it to follow relationships. So if you said on a tweet, value for key path, tweeter.name, it would give you the name of the Twitter user. You see, it would follow that relationship over to the user and get the name. Even though I would be saying value for key path on a tweet, tweeter.name on a tweet is followed through the relationship. Okay, so that's what the key path thing will do. Got that? Now, that just sounds exciting, I'm sure. Uh, but we actually almost never use these methods, and you'll find out uh, in a moment why that is. Okay, so that's the key, that's the value. Uh, I already talked about what all the values are, right? The NS data is NS date, uh, NS sets if it's a too many relationship, um, and NS managed object if it's not. Okay? All right, now changes, when you're changing something in the database, that only happens in memory. Okay, doesn't actually get stored in the database on disk until it saves. Now we know that UI manage document auto saves, so we're good to go there. But what if you use that other managed object context? It's not in UI manage document, so there's no auto save there. You have to save it. Okay? And you do that with this method called save. You send it to the manage object context, right? So here's that manage object context I got from my app delegate, and I want to save it, so I'm going to say context save. Now, that looks simple, right? Simple little four letter uh, function name there, save, but actually it's gonna cause me to have to give you two or three slides worth of information about Swift, okay? Because this is the first method that I'm showing you in this class that can throw an error, okay? And why might save throw an error? Eh, disk could be full, there could be some problem with the database that it can't be saved, there's lots of reasons, okay, um, that it could so throw an error. But what you need to know is how do I deal with that, okay? If it throws an error, what do I do? How do I look at the error, et cetera? And to do that, you need to learn about how throw works in Swift. So let's take a little time out from core data. You probably, you're supposed to have read about this in your reading assignment, but I'm sure it probably went right over your, how many people in this room feel like, yeah, I pretty much understand throw? See, zero, okay, so that's why I'm gonna take a couple slides here and explain it to you. All right, so this is throwing errors in Swift, a little side thing here, okay? So any function in Swift, like the save method in NS Managed Object Context, if it can throw an error, it'll have the word throws at the end of its declaration, okay? So the function, you read that when you're reading the code saying, oh, the function save throws. All right, <coughs> so, if you have a function that throws, you must deal with that. You cannot just ignore the fact that it throws. You must catch the error usually, okay? There's a little other ways to deal with it, but generally you must catch it. So how do you catch it? Well, you just put the word try in front of it. The try just means please try this, because I know it might throw, but try it, okay? So that's why it's called try, and if it's successful, Fine, if it doesn't, then it throws an error. Now, uh, when it throws the error, you have to catch it. And the way you catch it is you put this try inside of a do. See, it says do, open curly brace, close curly brace. Anything inside this do that you try that throws will allow you to catch the error right after the do, okay? And so I can say catch let error here. I can actually catch different kinds of errors by having multiple catches here. Catch this, catch that, catch this, as many catches as I want, okay? And when I catch it, you see I have this let error. That basically lets this local variable here that's gonna be in this context, error, it lets it uh, be equal to the error that was thrown, okay? 
So now you have this error, and you inside here, inside the second curly brace here, you can look at that error and find out what it is and why, what clean up or try again or whatever you want to do, you can do it in here. Now these errors that get thrown, they are all implementers of this protocol error type. And this error type protocol doesn't have much in it. It's mostly just a way to identify that this is an error that got thrown. Okay? Now, iOS has a very important class called NSError, which implements this protocol. When iOS throws an error, it's always going to be an NSError. Okay? And that class you should go look at. Okay? It has methods in there like localized description of the error, uh, things like that that you can use to put errors up to the user even, or certainly put things on the console to say what's going on, or just to look at it yourself, like what did that error, uh, et cetera, okay? So NS error is kind of iOS's thing, but if you had something that you thought would be good to throw an error, you can invent your own thing that gets thrown as long as it implements this error type protocol, okay? Now usually the things that implement the error type protocol are enums. Because when you have something that can throw an error, it usually can throw two or three different kinds of things. And so that's, each of those is an enum case with associated data that goes along with the error. All right? That's the great thing about enums in Swift. You got this associated data. So if there's an error, you can you know, hand, hand along some interesting information about the error. Okay? Now, if inside the catch you can't deal with this error, you could re-throw it by just saying throw error. In fact, in general, anytime you want to throw an error, that's how you do it. You say throw error. And again, this has to be of type error type protocol there. Uh, you can throw it and rethrow it. Now, the only thing about this is if you're going to rethrow here, maybe, then your whole method also has to say throws at the end because you might be rethrowing. Okay? Okay, so that's basically how it fundamentally works. Now, there's an extra little interesting thing here, which is try with an exclamation point. Okay? If you have try with an exclamation point, that means forget all this junk. I'm not going to put it in a do. I'm not going to catch anything. And if this throws, crash my app. Okay, we know that exclamation point usually means force this thing and crash if it doesn't work. That's what for implicit, for uh, uh, optional unwrapping, right? We do exclamation point, boom. That means crash if this thing is nil. So same thing here. You can say try. Uh, and it'll crash. Now, you would never want to do that with context save, because context save can get errors unpredictably, right? So you would never want to do that here. But other methods, sometimes it's like, this method has to succeed, or I'm just doomed. So I'm going to uh, try exclamation point. There's one other way, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides, which is try question mark. Okay, Try question mark means, uh, try this. I'm, I'm not going to catch the error, but return nil if there was a thrown error. Okay, that's try question mark. I'm going to show you an example of that in a couple of slides. Okay, so that's throwing of errors. Everybody got that? There's not a lot of things that throw errors, but you are going to run across them, okay, in both in some of the homeworks and also certainly in your final project. Okay, so let's get back to core data here. Now, uh, calling value for key and set value for key uh, is pretty ugly. Okay, there's no type checking there because it's any object is the type of the argument. Okay, and you get all these literal strings like quote text and quote created and quote ID uh, inside your uh, code, which you're probably going to put in a struct, you know, static let, like you do all your constants, but it's just a mess. Okay, keep all that. What you really want is vars. You want these tweets. You want to be able to have a var on there called text. And you just want to say that tweet dot text equals. That's what you want, okay, object oriented. So of course we can do that. And the way we do that is we're going to create a subclass of NS managed object, okay? So for each thing, a tweet, Twitter user, whatever, we're going to create a subclass of NS object, managed object for it. And it's going to have vars, which are all the properties. Okay, couldn't be easier. Really, really, really simple. And uh, Xcode will even generate this subclass for us. Okay, so let's look at how you do that. So I'm going to select the entities that I want to generate these little subclasses for. Okay, so I'm selecting them both in this case right here. Then I go up to the editor menu and I pick create NS managed objects subclass. Okay. When I do that, it's going to say, okay, for which of your models do you want to do that? Because you might have multiple models. So I'll pick the only model I have here. Then it says, okay, well, which entities? Well, I selected both, so it's got these both pre-selected. I want to create uh, a NS managed object subclass for tweet and one for Twitter users. It's going to be two different classes. 
Okay, now it's saying, where do you want to put it? Uh, it's also asking what language. Be careful right here. Sometimes this comes up Objective-C, even if you're in a Swift project. So make sure that says Swift. Otherwise, you're going to get an Objective-C class, uh, which is a subclass of Managed Manage Object. You don't want that. So it's Swift. Uh, the other thing is there's this use scalar properties for primitive data types. Uh, be careful of this one. If you turn this on, then, for example, NSDate, the property it creates, the var, is going to be an NS time interval, which is going to be the number of seconds since 1970. Okay, so you probably don't want that most of the time, right? You want it to be an NS date object. Um, also, you're going to put it, uh, it's just going to say where it's going to put it. By default, it usually says to put it at the very top level, but you usually actually want it down where all the rest of your files are, down here like in core data example, right? So make sure you get that right too. So be, be, pay attention to this thing and answer all these questions the way you want, okay? It's not one you can just click create and just move on through or you won't get what you want, I don't think. All right, so it created these things. Here they are. You can see them on the side here. There's one, tweet.swift, okay? Here's twitteruser.swift. And it's just a class, tweet, as promised. Look at that, it inherits from NS Manage Object. And you can put any code you want in here to do tweet-specific stuff. Because, you know, the fact that the tweet is stored in the database is great, but it might also have some other behavior that you want to add. It's just a class. Right? You're using it in your app, so you might want to put some, some code in there. Okay, So it's perfectly good for that. Um, here's Twitter user. Right? Okay, it's an image object. Put all your Twitter user stuff here. But what about those vars? Okay, I, I thought there was going to be vars for text and uh, created and the screen name. for the, Where are those? Well, it turns out those are put in extensions. You see them right here? There's two of them, that one and that one. So let's look at those. Okay, This file right here, this extension. This is creating a property of R for each of the things, the attributes and relationships to uh, in my tweet object. Now, why does it put them off in an extension here? Why didn't it just put it in the other class? Can anyone think of a reason why this would want to be an extension? It's a good reason, actually, which is that you might want to change these attributes and relationships over time. As you're working on your app, you decide you need a new property, OK? Well, you're going to regenerate this file when you do that. You don't want to blow away any other code that you wrote for tweet, right? So it keeps all the stuff that's being generated by uh, Xcode when you do that create and manage object subclass. It's keeping it all in one file so it can be constantly overwritten. Make sense? See, that's why we put in an extension there. Now let's look at this wacky extension here. Well, what's going on here? Well, it's, uh, these are obvious, right? Text, ID, and created. Why are they optional? Because they're nil. When you first create a tweet, it's empty. Those things are all nil, so it has to be an optional. Um, and then look at this one, tweeter, as promised again. Twitter user. Now, I told you that tweeter, since it's a relationship, is, would be an NS Manage object. But the system is smart enough to say, well, not only is it an NS Manage object, but I know it's a Twitter user. Okay, which is this other class over here that it created. By the way, sometimes when you generate a whole bunch of things at once, it will miss that. Okay, it'll be, it won't notice. It'll just have this be NS managed object. Just regenerate them again if that happens. Okay, uh, it's just like because it's like a one instead of being a two phase generation, it's like a one phase generation. If it does one class before the other, it didn't know that Twitter user existed by the time it did tweet. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Hopefully they'll fix that someday. It might already be fixed in the latest version, but uh, just regenerate if you get that problem. So anyway, Twitter is a Twitter user. That makes sense, right? That's what a Twitter is, is a, is a Twitter user. Let's go look at tweet. Same thing here. Uh, here's the screen name and the name. Those are strings. Now look at it. tweets. It's an NS set. And inside this NS set is going to be what? Tweet objects, right? Because that's what this is, the tweets that this Twitter user has tweeted. So this NS set is going to have tweet, tweet objects, this class right up here. OK? Now, what about this at sign NS manage thing? What the heck? We've never seen that before. What is that? OK, well, that's basically just some magic <laughs> that says, the system is going to take care of that, of this var, OK? Because otherwise, where is this var stored? It can't just be a normal stored property, because when it changes, it needs to change in the database. So there's got to be code going on there. It, it kind of could be a computed property, but you certainly don't want the computed co property code in here. So this NS Manage basically says that it's a dynamic uh, var, and when it gets accessed, it causes other code in core data 
to be executed, and that's basically going to do value and value for key and set value for key for you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what if I change the key? Like, like if I rename screen name to be ampersand name or something like that? Uh, no, you have to go back and regenerate them, okay? You're always having to regenerate. This is not kept in sync with the visual map. You have to regenerate all the time. Again, that's why you want this to be a separate file from the other thing. Okay, so NS Manage is just magic that Core Data uses. You don't even have to worry about it. Uh, it's not, you're never going to have to actually type this in or anything. It's always just in this generated thing. Okay, so how do I access these entities using these subclasses uh, and get the properties, okay? So it's pretty simple. Let's say I get my managed object context. Here I'm getting it from my uh, UI managed document, but I could have gotten it from my app delegate, whatever. I got my context. Uh, I'm going to create one by saying insert new object for entity for name, same as before, except for look at the yellow text. I'm going to cast it, downcast it, to be a tweet because I know that these tweet entities have this associated subclass with them. Got it? So that's the magic right there. That's the thing that turns this tweet that you're creating into a tweet so that now that it's a tweet, you can say things like tweet.tweeter equals or tweet.created equals or tweet.text equals, tweet.tweeter.name equals you can even do. Okay, see what's happening here? Tweet.tweeter.name, I'm actually just using properties to go through. We know the type of tweeter is a Twitter user and we know that Twitter user has a var which is the name. Make sense? Okay. So this is a lot nicer than saying set value this comma for key text. It's a lot nicer to look like this. This is like normal, uh, normal uh, Swift code. And also Swift can type check all of this to make sure you're providing the right types. All right. Okay, so now let's talk about deletion briefly. Uh, you can delete objects from the database. Uh, it's, uh, it's very easy. It's almost too easy. Uh, you just call delete object. Okay, and it will delete it from the database. There's a little bit of a question. If I delete a tweet, okay, does it delete the Twitter user who tweeted it? Probably not. If I delete a Twitter user, does it delete all the tweets that the Twitter user tweeted? Maybe so. Okay, so you can determine that rule for what happens when something is deleted back in the visual mapper. You just inspect the relationship and you can put the delete rule in there. You can read all about what the settings are uh, in the documentation. Uh, but you can basically have cascading deletes that delete, like that's probably what you would have if you deleted a Twitter user. It would cascade and delete all the tweets. And you can have just a nilling one, where if you deleted a certain uh, tweet, it's just going to remove it from the set and the Twitter user's set will be automatically uh, updated. Okay. One thing, once you delete this tweet, make sure you don't keep a strong pointer to it because it now points to something that's invalid because you deleted it from the database so you can't set any of its attributes or do anything because it's gone. Okay, so it kind of gets into a weird state here. So just make sure you don't do anything with that. All right, one thing that's kind of fun about deletion here is that uh, your NS Managed Object subclass like tweet or Twitter user will be sent this method, prepare for deletion, when someone tries to delete it. And in there, you can do a lot of things. You could decrement some count, for example, if you're keeping a track of, of a count or something like that. Uh, one thing you don't have to do in here, though, is modify any relationships. That happens for you automatically. So if I delete a tweet okay, from the database, it automatically gets removed from any NS sets that Twitter users point to. Even if I go into an NS set, okay, of tweets and I delete a tweet out of there, it will, uh, you know, any, both sides of every relationship get updated. So you never have to update either side of a relationship. You touch one, the other side stays in sync. That's one of the really cool things about core data. So you don't have to do that in a prepare for deletion. Prepare for deletion lets you do other things, other things you might be counting or doing other things. All right, so. Now we know how to create our database, set all the data in there. It's awesome. Now we get to the real value of having the data in there, which is querying. Okay? So now we want to go and look in the database and get the objects we want based on certain criteria. 
Okay? And how do we do that? Um, the main piece of this is this class called NSFetchRequest. Okay? And NSFetchRequest is going to let us specify which objects we want out of the database, and they're going to come back in an array. It's as simple as that. Okay? So how do we create an NSFetchRequest? We need four things. One, the entity to fetch. This is very important to understand. Okay? You can only fetch one kind of thing with a fetch request. There's no fetch request in the world that's going to give you an array of some tweets and some Twitter users. Okay? It's always going to give you an array of all the same thing. All tweets or all Twitter users. Okay? So you specify the entity, the one entity, that's going to be in this fetch request. All right? uh, the second thing is how many objects you want to limit your fetch to. Like maybe you only want to fetch 100 or you want to fetch them in groups of 20 or 40 or something like that. You can specify that in the request. You can specify how to sort the result. Because I told you the result comes back as an array. Arrays are ordered. So you can specify what order the things you're fetching come back in. All right? And then lastly, and most importantly, you're going to specify the predicate. This is the description of which objects you want. Okay? So let's look at all of these things. Um, here's what the code looks like basically to create a request right here. So let's look at all parts of it. So we're creating a request with a certain entity. Here I'm setting the batch size and fetch limits, and then the sort descriptors and predicate we'll talk about in the next slide. So the batch size of 20 here just means that when I fetch, um, it's going to look like it returns all the objects, but it's actually only going to fetch them at 20 at a time. Okay? This is really great for things like table views where you know the person's scrolling through it, and so you don't want to fetch all million items. You know that you can fetch them in batches as they go along. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about another important thing called faulting, which makes it so you can have a million items in a table, and it's still pretty lightweight, even if you don't send a, set a batch limit, uh, but you can. Also, you might have something where there's thousands of objects, but maybe your UI can only show 100. It's just the maximum you can show. Well, then you can say, only give me the first 100. Okay, that's also uh, allowed. All right, so let's talk about the two most important ones. So you don't really use these very much, but the sort descriptor and the predicate you are going to use a lot. So let's talk about those in detail. Uh, the sort descriptor um, is an array of descriptions of things to sort by. Okay, and it's going to use those sort by things to sort the things that come out of the array or to come out of the database when it puts them in the array. Okay, so here's what it looks like to create a sort descriptor. Uh, it has a few different initializers, but here's kind of one of its most uh, verbose ones. Uh, first is the key that you're going to be sorting by. So if I'm looking for Twitty users, I might want the array to come back sorted by the screen name, okay, at sign whatever. Okay, I want to sort it by that. So I would create a descriptor where the key is screen name, because that's what I want it to sort by. Ascending is whether it's, you know, the at sign A people come first, or the at sign Z people come first, right? So it's, is it an ascending list or descending list? And then this selector, which is usually optional, you don't usually need it, is kind of interesting. It's basically something that just says, how do I sort these strings? Okay? Do I just sort them alphabetically? Well, what does it mean to sort alphabetically? Okay? This localized standard compare means alphabetically in the way that people are used to seeing it in the finder on the Mac, basically. So it's kind of like user sensible alphabetical order. Okay? There's other alphabetical orders that are more like strict alphabet order, but maybe they don't deal with diacritics, you know, they don't look they don't sort diacritics properly. Uh, things like, or capitalization they may not do right. So this is a good one. And this is the default, so you probably don't need to put this in here. Uh, but this can basically be, if this is a string, okay, if screen name is a string, which it is, uh, then this can be uh, any string method. Now, there are some string methods that are magic and are actually done on the database side. So they're super efficient, okay? And you can read the documentation to find out which ones. This is definitely one of them, okay? So this method is not actually being called on every single screen name in the database. Uh, you know, in other words, not, it's not fetching them, calling that method, fetching the next one, calling it, comparing them, trying to sort it. Uh, no, this is happening in the database, okay? The database knows how to do the sort. All right, so that's the sort descriptor. Now, um, notice that uh, we, when we create our fetch request, we actually provide an array 
of sort descriptors. We don't just give one sort descriptor. We do an array. Why would we need an array? Well, sometimes you, maybe you're searching for names, people by name, and you want to search by last name first and then by first name. Right? That's common thing to do. So you can give an array of sort descriptors. The first sort descriptor is the last name sort descriptor, and then the second one is the first name sort descriptor. Okay? That's why it's an array. All right. Now, and as predicate, the real guts of how we do all this. Uh, the predicate is a really flexible object. Okay? You, this is one where you really have to go read NS Predicates documentation. Okay? It would take me, I could have a whole lecture on all the things NS Predicate can do. The format of NS Predicate is, NS Predicate is basically you have a constructor here, an initializer, which takes a format string like this with little percent at signs in it that you put then at the end. See, here's two percent at signs. You put them at the end, Joe and a date, right? Um, and these values get put into this spot. It's like printf. Okay, you all know printf. It's who, who does? Who, does everyone know? Who, if you don't know what printf is, raise your hand. Okay, so everyone knows what printf is. Just like printf uh, in that way. But of course, this is has meaning. Okay, meaning in terms of what you can search in the database. So here's just some examples. Here, for example, I'm searching the database to find all the tweet. These are all uh, searches for tweets, by the way. All these things you're seeing right here, searches for tweets. So here I'm trying to find a tweet whose text contains case insensitively, that's what that square bracket C means, this text. And the text is the search string. Okay? So I have some search string. I'm trying to find all the tweets uh, that uh, contain that text. Okay? Or here's another one down here. I want to find all the tweets that were tweeted by Joe and were created before or after some date. A date right there. See that? And then here is uh, an interesting one. I'm saying, give me all the tweets, not Twitter users, tweets whose tweeter screen name is CS193P. So this is all of CS193P's tweets. Okay, so even though this says tweeter dot screen name, this is a tweet query. See that? Okay. Now here's interesting. This is only the tip of the iceberg. You can do some pretty powerful things. Here, for example, I'm doing a tweet Twitter user request down here at the bottom, and I'm trying to find all the Twitter users that have tweets that contain the search string. Okay. So that's pretty powerful, since tweets is a too-many relationship. But it can do that. All right? So you got to read up on NS Predicate to know what you can do. In your homework, I'm going to ask you to do something pretty straightforward. So don't worry too much, but you're going to need to not skip the step of going and reading this. You can also make compound predicates. Uh, basically, you have this NS compound predicate. You can make an AND predicate or an OR predicate. And you just give it an, an array of other predicates, and it'll AND them together. Now, you don't need to do that because you can put OR and AND in the predicate string. But sometimes you want to like, calculate which ones you want. Okay? You want by some if-thens or something, you want to decide which ones are there. And so this is a good way to AND them together. All right? Or AND or OR. Um, okay, I'm not really going to talk about this whole slide, actually, advanced querying. Um, but there are some kind of weird little uh, things you can put in your predicate, like at sign average, which will assume that this is returning an array, and it'll average all of these keys in that array. Okay, so here, for example, I have tweets.tweet. I'm basically looking at all of the tweets that this Twitter user has tweeted, and I'm averaging the latitude, assuming they had a longitude and latitude on the tweet. I'm averaging the latitude to find the average latitude at which someone tweets. Okay, well, that's kind of weird, but um, you can do that stuff. So same thing with counts. Okay, now you're seeing count here, but in, in your homework, you're going to be asked to do a count, but not with this. Okay, this won't work for the kind of counting I'm asking you to do. You're just going to have to have code that counts for that. Okay, so don't get confused by this. Do not use at sign count in your homework. All right, and down here it's talking about this class NS expression, which lets you create these arbitrary expressions to search for. Again, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, you don't need to do it for your homework. Uh, you can certainly take a look at the class NS expression. It's pretty amazing what's in there. Okay, all right, so 
let's put this all together, all this querying business. So I'm going to create this fetch request for a Twitter user. Okay? I want to have all the tweets that this Twitter user has created in the last 24 hours. So how do I do that? Okay, I'm going to fetch into, uh, actually, I'm not going to create all the, sorry, be clear here. I'm fetching all the Twitter users who have tweeted in the last 24 hours. Okay, so I'm fetching Twitter users, so that's my entity. Um, I'm going to create the time yesterday, which is just the time interval since now of minus 24 hours. This is in seconds, okay. Then I'm going to create the predicate, which is any tweets that were created after yesterday, 24 hours ago. Okay? See that predicate? Pretty fun. And then I'm going to sort the result by the name of the Twitter user. Not a screen name, but the actual name. And ascending is true, so I want the A's at the beginning and the Z's at the end. OK, so this, I create this request. Now, I have a request. How do I get the array, which is all of these things? OK, we do that with a method in your managed object context. I told you you need a managed object context for everything, and you do, creating and also for, for fetching. You're going to use this method in your context called execute fetch request, and you just give it the NS fetch request. It returns an NS array, OK, or an array, a bridge to an array, OK? Uh, of all the things. Now, if that array is empty, not nil, but empty, that means nothing matches your request. There's nothing in the database that matches that. In other words, in the, using the previous slide, there are no Twitter users who have tweeted in the last 24 hours. That's empty array. Um, otherwise, it's going to return a sorted array of all the Twitter users, sorted by their name, who have tweeted in the last 24 hours. Okay? And the, the objects in there in that array will be Twitter user, instances of Twitter user. OK, because that's what I searched for. Now, notice that I have to try, OK, context try, OK? That's because this method throws. Now, if this throws, it probably means there's some problem with your database, OK? Like maybe your database is not open. Maybe you tried to send this to a UI managed object, uh, managed documents context, and you never opened it, so it's not opened or something like that. You could ignore the throw by doing try question mark. The thing that try question mark does that you have to realize is it turns whatever this is, this method call, whatever it returns, it turns it into an optional. So execute fetch request returns an NS array or an array. So by putting try question mark, it makes this now return an optional array. And why is that? That's because if it throws, it's going to return nil. Okay? So it's a little funky uh, to realize this, but it's just going to turn this into an optional array. And so let users, users right there, is going to be of type optional array. Okay, optional array of uh, NS managed object, actually, to be exact. All right? Um, so a lot of times we do do try question mark here because we don't really know what to do to handle an error. Uh, so if we do a fetch and it comes back nil and there was some problem, it's kind of like we'll report an error to the user or something, but it's like there's not much we can do. Okay, so sometimes this is a case where we might do try question mark there. Okay, so that's it. Very simple. Now you have the array of objects back. You can do whatever you want with them. Um, I want to talk a little about performance. Uh, you know, if you had a million, what if you had a million objects and you said, show me all the Twitter users, a million tweets or something, or a million Twitter users, and you said, show me all the Twitter users uh, that uh, tweeted in the last 24 hours, and there were 750 or 7,000 of them. Are you really going to get an array with 7,000 objects, all of, each of which has the screen name and the name and whatever else? I mean, that would be massive, right? And the answer is no, you don't get that. You get this kind of magical thing, which is an array of husks, okay, of those objects, if you want to think of it that way. So they're not really there. And in fact, if you tried to print them, okay, if you use print to print it, it would just say, this is an NS managed object. It wouldn't show you the screen name or the name or anything else about it because it doesn't actually pull that data until you ask for it, okay? Until you ask specifically for a Twitter user's name or for his screen name, it doesn't get that out of the database. This is called faulting, okay? The objects live in this kind of husk state where they don't actually have their data, and when you ask for them, the data gets faulted in. Now, when that faulting happens, it might be happening in big bunches because it might be more efficient for the database to fault in 100 at a time, 
okay? But it's all happening behind the scenes. The only reason I even mention it is because you might be trying to print these things out, and you're like, what? where's my name and screen name? Okay? And you'll know why. It's because it's not been faulted yet. Okay? So if you really want the name or screen name, you, want, you have to do dot name so it faults it in. You can see it. Okay? All right, let's talk about thread safety with core data. Okay? NS managed object context is not thread safe. So you cannot have a context, fork off some closure on another thread with dispatch and access it. Okay? So that sounds really bad. Because a database, you can imagine I'd want to have another thread doing some heavy intensive database thing like loading the database up or doing some complicated queries or something like that. Um, and you're telling me I can't do it because it's not thread safe? Well, no, of course you can do it. And the way you have to do it is NS Manage Object, each NS Manage Object instance has to have its own thread. Okay? Now, the cool thing is you can have multiple NS Managed Object contexts on the same database. Okay, so how does that work? So you have this image managed object context, it's writing into the database. When it hits save, that save goes out to the database and other managed object contexts will start seeing it. Okay, so when they do fetches, they'll see it. So it basically works through the saves. When you save through one context, boom, the other ones start seeing it automatically. As soon as they, next time they fetch, they're gonna automatically see it, okay? So it's really kind of cool that it just uses threads, okay, queues, uh, to do this. Now, that does mean that the queues you use them on, they have to be serial queues. You can't have concurrent queues because then you'd have one managed object in different threads because a concurrent queue can fire off multiple threads to go execute its little blocks. All right, so it has to be serial queue. Now, the kind of uh, NS managed object context that you get by doing that app delegate thing and the one you get from doing UI managed documents those are both main queue in this managed object context. can only be used on the main queue. So don't ever like fork those off and start using those on another queue. Now, you can create your own NS managed object context on other queues if you want. There's an initializer for it. I'm not really going to talk about that. You're not going to need to do that uh, for this class. But that's how you would do concurrency. Okay? Now, when you have, because of this, because you can have these multiple contexts, you got to know about this method right here, perform block. Very important method in managed manage object context. And it basically just takes a closure here, closure that takes no arguments, returns nothing. And inside this block, you always know with 100% certainty, whatever code you're executing in here is going to be performed on this context's safe queue. Okay, the queue that it was created on, the queue that it's running on, the queue that won't cause any problems, always. Okay? So really, anytime you do anything with core data, anytime you access an NS managed object context or any of the NS managed objects you get out of it, you want to do it inside a perform block. Do you hear what I just said? I'm going to say it again. Perform block wants to be wrapped around every access to any NS managed object context or NS managed object of any kind. Okay? Now, in your homeworks, you're only ever going to have one context, or you might say, what a waste. Why do you need to put these stupid perform blocks around everything? I know everything's in the main context. Well, the answer is you want to get used to doing this, okay? Because eh, maybe down the road, you do add another thread that loads up the database with more tweets or something like that, and all of a sudden it starts breaking. Uh, if you're not performing things on the right context. Okay, so just get in the habit of doing this. You can also perform block and wait, which will cause this code to be executed on the safe queue and wait till it's done and then continue on this queue. Okay, so you can do that as well. So always wrap perform block around anything you do in, in core data. All right. Um, Oh yeah, quick thing on the parent uh, context. Most contexts, most managed object contexts have a parent context, okay? That parent context is either the context that's actually writing it to the database, or in some cases it's another NS managed object context, so that when you save, it's actually just saving it to another context, and then that context saves again. UI managed document works this way, okay? And what's kind of cool is that that parent context is almost always on a different queue. So if you're using UI managed object, uh, UI managed document, you can actually do a little trick, which is if you want to run something for that database on another queue, just perform block on the parent context. 
parent context is just a method in managed managed object context, right, or a property. Uh, just do perform block on that. Now you'll be performing it on a different queue, off the main queue, okay, and it'll be in that database. Everything will be fine. So it's kind of a trick. Okay, again, you won't need that for your assignment, but just understand that you can do that. All right, so there's so much more to core data. I, just no way, I mean, we've already been here in an hour, so it barely covered the basics. So there's optimistic locking in there. It has full undo redo, which is incredible. You can specify things like staleness, you know, when I have to refetch this thing, how much time goes by for it to refetch, uh, all that stuff. You have to go look at the documentation for NS managed object context, okay? That's really the core of where this stuff is all happening um, and to find out more about it. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to do any of this for your homework, but you gotta know that it's out there, or when you get in the real world and start doing this, you'll be missing opportunities to do cool features. All right, the last thing I talk about is the interrelationship between core data and UI table view. As you can imagine, if you've got this huge database of stuff, a great place to show it is in a table view. Okay, in fact, 99% of the time, either a table view or a collection view is how you're gonna show the stuff in a big database. Okay, and that's so common that uh, iOS provides this awesome class, NS Fetched Results Controller, okay, which is a class which will hook up an NS Fetch request to a UI table view. And not just hook it up once, but hook it up so that if the database changes in any way that the fetch request would return different results, it ups updates the table. Okay, so the database could be changing but behind the scenes, the table is just always staying in sync with it. So that fetch request and that table are always in sync, okay, which is really, really cool. Okay, it makes it really easy for you to implement uh, your table views with stuff out of the database. Okay, so how do you use NS fetch, re fetch results controller? Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about how, how fetch results controller actually works. It's very simple. It provides methods to implement all those UI table view delegate methods, like number of sections in table, number of rows and sections. The only one it doesn't implement is self row and index path. You still have to implement that. Because, of course, self row and ind index path knows about, you know, the custom UI cells or whatever, so it, you have to be the one who's putting that data on screen in the right way. But in terms of all the other uh, things in the UI table view data source, even things like section he headers and all that stuff, NS Fetch Results Controller will do all that for you. It has methods to implement all those things. So here's a couple examples of what it looks like here. Okay, um, the other thing it can do, which is kind of cool, well, I'll talk about it in a second. Let's talk about self row and index path since you're responsible for in implementing that. The key method you need to know from Fetch Results Controller is object at index path, okay? This is a method that you can send to it. You give it an index path into the table and it will return you the NS managed object at that row, okay? Now this might be a subclass of NS managed object like tweet or Twitter user, but it's gonna return it to you. So the, in your self row at index path, you're gonna call this, okay? At this index path to get the object that's at that row and then you're gonna use that object to fill out the information in that row. Okay, that's what self row and index path does. Everyone understand this? Super important you understand this, because otherwise you're like, how do I do that? Okay, self row and index path, this is how you do it. Okay, so this fetch results controller is probably going to be a var in your UI table view controller, okay, that you're going to have created with a fetch results, with an NS fetch request, and uh, then in your self row and index path, you're going to find out each of the things that are in the database that match your fetch one per row, this is gonna return it, okay? All right, uh, so how do we create an NS fetch results controller, by the way? All you do, it's really all you have to do is create that NS fetch request, that's it, okay? So, uh, for example, here I'm going to create a fetch results controller. You can see that its initializer takes the fetch request, obviously the context, and then this is kind of a cool thing, the uh, section name key path, if all of the objects in your database, okay, know the section they should be in, they have some key in there that is the section they're supposed to be in, then you can specify that, sec that key right here and it'll automatically do the sections for you, okay? The only thing is you gotta make sure you sort the result of your fetch sorts in the same order as those sections sort, but uh, it'll do that for you. And then this cache right here, it'll actually cache the results on disk Okay, so if you have a really complicated 
fetch that might take a lot of resources. It will cache the result. The only thing about this is uh, you cannot change the request. The data can be changing all the time, but the request itself, the predicate and the source scriptures, has to be the same. If you ever change it, then this cache obviously becomes kind of useless. All right, so how would we create a fetch results controller doing this? I'm going to create the request. So like I'm going to fetch tweets here. I'm going to put tweets in my table view. So each row in my table view is going to be a different tweet. Uh, I'm going to sort by the created. So the newer tweets maybe are going to be at the beginning. Um, and then my predicate is going to be all tweeters who, uh, whose tweeter's name equals a certain name. So I'm looking for all the tweets by a certain tweeter who has a certain name. Okay, And then when it gets to this result, each row in my table view is going to be that tweet that matches. Okay, And uh, fetch results controller is going to make sure that's always true. Even if I added another tweet to the database that matched it, the table view would add another row at the bottom automatically. Okay. Um, yeah, I talked about the cache name. And yeah, this key that says which attribute is the section name has to sort in the same order as the sort descriptor. Sort descriptors. OK? All right. Uh, the fetch results controller also, uh, while it's watching the database, OK, the w well, I told you it watches the database and keeps them in sync. The way it does that is it has a delegate. The fetch results controller has a delegate, OK? Um, so here's one of its delegate methods. Controller did change object in index path for change type new index path. Okay, here see how it's basically noticing the database change, telling you what changed, tell you what index paths changed in the table view. It's basically telling you exactly what to do because uh, the database changed. Um, now in here, you're supposed to call all the UI table view methods that would be appropriate to cause this to update the table. Okay, insert a row, put some there, whatever, delete a row. All that. Well, now you're part, probably starting to think, hey, I thought this NS Fetch Results Control was supposed to be easy, but I got to implement all this in here for all these delegate methods? Eh, it's just too hard. OK, well, lucky for you, we're going to provide a class for you called Core Data Table View Controller, something we wrote that does all that for you. OK, um, this, all that stuff it does for you, you can actually see all that in the documentation for NS Fetch Results Controller right at the top. It actually shows you the code that you want to use. Unfortunately, it's in Objective-C. So we've written it all in Swift for you uh, and provided this class, Core Data Table View Controller. So you're just going to make this Table View Controller be your subclass or your superclass of your Table View Controller so that you'll inherit all this NS Fetch Results uh, Controller uh, functionality. And all you need to do to make it work is uh, it has a var, this core data view, table view controller only has one public thing, which is a var, which is a fetch results controller. You just need to create this fetch results controller, which means creating the NS fetch result, re fetch request, and then set this var. And once you set this var, it's automatically going to start updating your table. Okay. Now, of course, you're going to have to implement self row and index path because you've got to load up your thing however you're going to um, load it up. Uh, but that's all you have to do. Self so row index path, set this var, and you're winning. Okay? Now, uh, that's it for core data. Uh, remember that assignment four has nothing to do with core data. Okay? So do not do anything with core data in assignment four. Assignment five is going to be a lot of core data. Okay? So, I mean, I have to teach you the stuff before I give it to you, like I did for assignment four, but then I have to teach you the stuff for the next thing, and sometimes people get confused and they think the thing I'm teaching now goes into the assignment that went out a couple days ago, but no. Okay, so A4, assignment four, new core data. A5, all core data, basically. Okay? So next week, I'll do a demo on this, okay? On Monday, I'm going to do a big old demo where we're going to do all of the stuff I talked about uh, today so you can see how it all works in action, as always. Uh, and then you'll have A5 go out that's on Monday, and it's going to be due the next Monday. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, I'm going to do auto layout because I've kind of been hinting at auto layout, showing you a little bit here and there. But now I'm going to talk about really how auto layout works to lay out your uh, user interface. Um, you can use Stack View for a lot of things, but sometimes you need a little bit of extra layout capabilities. And next week, I'm also going to talk about the requirements for your final project. Okay, what you are required to do to have a successful uh, final project. And so it's time now for you to start thinking a little bit about what you might want to do for a final project. And certainly, as soon as I give this lecture next week on final project requirements, right away you're going to want to nail down what you want to do because you only get three weeks to do it. So it not only gives you a week or so to think of what you want to do. Okay, So be ready to kind of go out of the gate uh, with that next week.
Okay, that's it. I will see you next week. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.